Dr. G, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy yeah, how, you. How, how are we doing today in beautiful? Well, you're good. in L.A. Yeah, L.A. Right? good. Santa Monica's sunny right now. A lot of rain last night, you know, and uh, and just seeing folks, seeing folks in the office. It's good. Yeah, can't complain. Well, I know I'm, uh, I feel fortunate that I was even, even able to get on your schedule because uh, right, well, I know how you know, packed that thing can be. Yeah, it's that Gunnar Peterson connection, man. That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just got to, you know, leverage those connections. All right. Um, so, uh, I was just telling you, but I, I was doing quite a bit of prep for this. And, uh, by the time I got done looking at your bio, I was like, I don't even know if there's going to be time to talk about nutrition. You, sure. you have, you have lived quite an exciting life. I must say. Uh, yeah, I've been around the block. Yeah. <laughs> been around the block. It's a lot of wounds. I got a lot of wisdom from a lot of wounds. Like, like ultimately, you know, finding my way years ago into that realm of nutrition. And if you ask my wife, she'll be the first person to say, look, Golia, best in the world at nutrition, literally sucks at everything else. Like, <laughs> just ask him about food because, you know, he knows nothing else. <laughs> like if somebody doesn't bring up salmon at a dinner table, I'm just sitting there quiet. I don't say a word. Like, oh, Ooh, man. What happened so about salmon? Yeah, well, I could talk. I could talk about salmon all day. Like, so I was telling you, I, I grew up actually north of Seattle, so like an hour south of the Canadian border. And uh, now I'm, you know, whatever. I'm I'm stuck on the East Coast here, probably for the rest of my life. And uh, yeah, it's just it's just tough to get my hands on good salmon out here. I got to be yeah. honest. Grouper. Grouper. Okay. Good alternative. Yeah, man. Where right. where, are the, where are the East Coast? Where? What? Uh, I'm in like Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Oh, PA. Yeah. Yeah, my dad went to St. Joe's College. Oh, okay, Philly guy. Yeah. Oh boy. Awesome, awesome. Well, and, and, you know, maybe maybe that's where we can start, though. Um, so, I mean, all American wrestler. I know you did rugby. You're yeah. in the bodybuilding hall of fame. Yeah. Uh, and you you do rally car racing still, yeah, I most, believe. Um, yeah, but uh, I'm doing some stuff for McLaren, and uh, then recently a buddy of mine, PJ Jones, Parnelli Jones's son actually lives has a place out in parker arizona where we have an extra place and oh, literally okay. right behind these homes is just desert and during the summer it's like 130 degrees so if you don't have something in water sport you know on the river literally right. you're sitting in your house in air conditioning because it's it's 130 degrees out and I, oh yeah i was cycling for years like competitively bicycling and i would try to get around have a suit and I would literally mm. start at 4.30 in the morning with frozen water bottles a whole bit and never made it once. I'd always have to call Lisa and go, come and get me, man. I'm fried. I'm done. You know, it was like seeing painted Indians in the sky and stuff like that. I was a mess. <laughs> you know, I was just like hallucinating. And it just gets so crazy hot there. But recently I've gotten into uh, UTV sport. You know, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. across the desert. Oh, that's awesome. Was, yeah, pretty awesome. Well, how, how do you even, so how do you keep cool doing something like that? You, you know, you, you don't, you, you're actually, your, your helmet has oxygen pumped into it. Ah, okay. And that's about as cool as you get other than the wind just hitting you. Yeah. Uh, but it is right. it's really, it's extraordinary. I mean, it's fun to race on the track. Like I, I raced for the Viper Racing League for years. I raced in Grand Am. Uh, now helping out with McLaren and Ogaro Motorsport and stuff. The tracks are amazing. Yeah. They're calculated, you know, like. You know what turns you're in. You know where people are on the track. In the desert, just from wind or the dynamics of the climate, it can change the positioning of the sand and dunes, all that. Oh, yeah. yeah well, so, I, I, just, I mean, visibility alone, right? Let, this, let, for, forget the fact that the entire course is, is changing yeah. every step I mean, of the you way. Get, you get guys in front of you, and you, you can't see anything which is why there are these running bars on the back of the utvs and they're all okay. lit up bright yellow and red and you're literally chasing the bars oh no way of those things that's wild I mean, hey. i'm an idiot the first time i really did this we were really out there and, and i had a utv that was not set up for you know really going balls out right and i was like where am i this is like this is insane <laughs> no idea where i am you know and all these all these vehicles are set up with gps and everything so they're tracking each other oh okay 
So they're tracking each other or like someone at like a command center is No, they're they're tracking each other and then they know oh, where wow. they're at. Like if you really go out like Baja one thousand, Baja five hundred. Like yeah. they're all GPS stuff. Also. Oh, that's pretty cool. I didn't pretty realize cool. that. What what are you doing with McLaren? You know, with so so a a buddy of ours, Gunnar Peterson and myself, Tom O'Gara owns the largest dealerships around the I don't know, probably Mississippi over. Oh, for wow. McLarens and Lambos and Bentleys and all of that. And having raced for quite some time and, and being rather good at it, Tom actually pulled me back in and got me into a McLaren and then and then helping out and then doing some instruction at Thermal down oh, cool. in Palm Springs, which is an amazing racetrack. But huh. Tom Agar and his group and his team of guys, like literally second to none. So when people buy a McLaren or a a, a sports minded vehicle that could be tracked from Tom, you know, they always have an opportunity to go to thermal and see the dynamics of the car, like what it can and can't do. Yeah. And years ago, he would do that with Vipers for Dodge. Um, a guy named Skip Thomas, he started the Viper Racing League. And, and I was one of their primary instructors. So people would buy a Viper, they'd come to the Viper Racing School. Uh, and we would take them through track sessions, like what the car and can, can and cannot do. Yeah. So literally, you know, first session out, we just scare the ever-loving shit out of them. Like, oh, my God, really? Does that? <laughs> and then we teach them all we get along. And they leave, like, just laser-focused because it's such an incredible experience. Oh, I'm sure. So, yeah. so that has nothing to do with nutrition. That's pure just your background as a driver. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I work oh, cool. a lot within nutrition for a guy named Gene Siegel who – who uh, owned Rum Bum Racing at the time, a buddy of mine, uh, hmm. racing Grand Am, started in GT3 Cup cars, and then he progressed into Daytona prototypes. But all these oh, wow. racers, you know, even working with a couple of Le Mans drivers, they are very nutrition-driven. Well, I, I have to imagine, and I, you know, I saw that you, uh, one of those Grand Am races was, was Daytona, and it was like a 24-hour right. race. And uh, that's one of the thoughts I have. It's like, okay, so one, it's hot in the car oh, right? right so you gotta be you gotta be sweaty it's like electrolytes everything it's no, like sure and, and the extended amount driving, of time you know your stint in the car multiple drivers yeah um so you gotta hydrate you gotta make sure you're fueling correctly and that that kind of rolled into endurance sport for me working with some of the best triathletes and cyclists around and i do God. really consider myself fortunate like working with that endurance sport group Prior to that, as a bodybuilder, you know, working with the bodybuilding community, sitting mm -hmm. there with my own salmon weighing 310 pounds. Uh, you got up to, you're, you're up to 310? Yeah. Oh, I mean, well, what, 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 what are you like walking around healthy? Like, yeah, like that thing up there. Oh, wow. All right. Yeah. If you're, if you're listening, folks, we got to, you got to check out the video. <laughs> how, how old are you there? God, I don't know. It was 1991. Jesus. Oh, no kidding. I mean, it's so Oh, go ahead. Sorry. A while ago. <laughs> what, what, what were you wrestling at in, in college? 177. You're kidding me. So you went, okay. Yeah, 177 to, to 310 pounds. And then competition weight was, you know, 260-ish, 260 plus. God, that's insane. Competition. No, it's crazy. But it taught me a lot. You know, it teaches yeah. you, sometimes I think, you know, it teaches you more than school because you literally try everything. And granted, you know, that's a lot of eggs, a lot of chicken, but it was a lot of drugs too. Uh, okay. You know, I was a walking pharmaceutical lab. <laughs> uh, those, those are like the, uh, well, I guess, pump, what, what was pumping iron? The, uh, is that 70, late 70s? Yeah, the 70s. 70s. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we were watching, I was watching that in college. Sure. I mean, you'd still watch I it. still watch it. Yeah. I'd, I'll throw it on tonight if my wife would let uh, me. Look at George, he's sick. Look at Louie. Damn. I remember I was in Gold's Gym and uh, I was being hypnotized for a sports hypnotherapy, like TV show thing for a week. Oh, cool. And his sports hypnotherapy guy had put me under the night before. And, uh, and then I got in there and he gave me my suggestions and I was about to do a series of bench presses hypnotized. And for Oh, wow. Know, I've never heard of doing yeah, like yeah, actual, you can do, actual lifting. Yeah. Okay. Him, he goes, Yo, Philly, make make sure they hypnotize all of you. You know, just say it. <laughs> so third rep with five and change, my pec split. And, uh, and I set up, I could just feel uh, my pec like falling down. And Fredo comes over. They didn't hypnotize all of you. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. 
<laughs> and then oh. two days later, they reattached my pack. So. God, 5'10", that's no joke. Yeah, man, it was big, big man. way. But it was crazy. I mean, you know, I felt like just saw little twigs and psh, psh, push them away. Just yeah. Oh, that's wild. So I, I gotta, I gotta ask. Did, did like the hypnotherapy? Did do you feel like? I mean, minus the tech, the pec yeah, splitting. Minus the pec tear. I mean, it did. Uh, certainly did it work? Focused. Yeah, I definitely worked. I could never protect that way. No. Um. Oh, really? So like, you did a lot more weight. Yeah, I mean, while you know, a single, you know, a single. Yeah, I can pop out a single, but you know, to start pushing out three reps of that. Oh, that's insane. Right. Um. I. I we talked to a guy. We. Uh, me. Uh, Adam Nelson, he was a gold medalist in the shot put in like the two thousands. Um, he is a great guy. I got to know him through uh, a nonprofit that he used to work for called like the D 10 decathlon, which is a great event. And, uh, he was big into hypnotherapy, but it was more, um, getting in the right mindset right before competition. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm forgetting the guy's name who he did it with, but it was all about just like snapping into that, like competition persona. Right. And he, and he swore by it as well. But like his whole thing was like, actually, you know, like mantras and the guy talking, right. Not guided meditation, but, uh, well, you almost kind of, used a guided a hypnosis. Word. Yeah. You used a little yeah. word, got it. No, same kind of thing. Yeah. Definitely increases <sighs> your intensity for sure. And your flow. Oh, I, I can't imagine. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, I started to tell you this before we were recording, so I think I've already said this. Uh, I'm a Seattle guy uh, at heart, and as I was prepping for this interview, this Russell Wilson article popped up that I'd like distinctly remember reading multiple times back in like 2017. Mm -hmm. And I was like, "Oh no way, this can't be this!" And so, sure enough, I read it again. Uh, yeah, I was like, "It's that guy." I, I must have sent. I sent it to my brother. Uh, I sent it to my dad at the time. Uh, yeah. So, but anyways, it was, it was just so interesting to see it all kind of come full circle, but I'm so glad I have you on. Cause I would love to talk about nutrition for, per, per performance, uh, if you're up for it. Absolutely. And you know what, Russell's interesting because he came in through his wife who came in through Gunnar Peterson. Ah, oh, so okay. Really trains all these folks and Gunnar is really, the guy really sticks to his wheelhouse, you know, if someone says, hey, what about a bench press? He'll tell you. If someone says, hey, Gunnar, what about chicken breast? He'll say, shut up. Go ask Golia. Don't ask me. Right <laughs> so it's a great, you know, it's a it's a great combination of personalities and relationships. You know, as he flips people over to me. Uh, yeah. And Sierra was one of them. And she kept on bugging Russell. You got to go see this dude. You got to see this dude. And then finally, he showed up. And, and, man, he was focused with his foods, just like her. Hmm. You know, Totally serious about everything. Well, yeah. and, you know, watching watching him for so long now, I mean, he is just, uh, I don't know, maniacal is almost the word in oh, terms yeah. of preparation and just, uh, you know, I just got his, um, you know, mental performance coach's new book. I haven't read it yet, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm, exci I'm excited to read that as well. But right. uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I just, I just thought that was really interesting. And it is funny, like all the guys that pop up athletically. I mean, back in the day when I first came to town in 1990, I was fortunate to work with a lot of the Raiders, like back okay. with Howie Long, Steve Golick, Bob Wright. Uh, uh, yeah, Bob, Bob Golick, Steve Wright. You know, back in the day, all those guys, and they were amazing. And talk about corn fed. They were just flat out strong. But oh, yeah. Nutrition attached to them. And then next up, I was working with Quincy Taylor, like the fastest guy, Quincy Watts, fastest, fastest guy in the world. Right? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, Quincy Watts. And, you know, that segued into working with some great athletes which moved me into endurance sport and then mm. even now like like when russell gives me a shout my goal with athletes and anybody i work with is to teach them the stuff so that they don't need me and so russell's learned it ciara's learned it you know they understand right. the consequence like an apple pie is not an apple a skip meal is as bad as eating pizza you know like that hmm. they learn it and then if you have questions they always call back always check in because they feel so comfortable doing it which is neat like yeah, DJ Subin, you know, NHL guy, same way. Yeah, because so you're not, you're not you're not giving them just enough to no, not no, quite no, let no. them get out there on their own yet. <laughs> I don't think that. I don't think that. I was a fat little kid and and a cancer survivor. You know, I did. Uh, yeah, I did read that. Yeah, and I'm, you know, I don't think that. I I think that if you had so something like cancer and you weren't a gifted athlete like me, I'm certainly not gifted. Hmm. And you really worked hard at it, and you then you went to school for it, and you worked hard at it again. 
Like if you have any wisdom at all, you should be totally free with it and give it to that athlete or, hmm. you know, that shoot, that, that housewife, that guy trying to drop his last 15, whatever. You don't keep them pinned to the floor in your office. Yeah. No, you want, you want to empower them. You hmm. want to get them to the place where they have full access to that unreasonable personality. Like if their bottle of water is empty, they will stop and go fill that son of a bitch up because they know how important it is. If yeah. their afternoon snack is a fruit and 12 almonds, they will be unreasonable and stop and go get it because they know that everything has a consequence. Hmm. And so it's cool. It's cool yeah. to see people take on 80 or 90% of what we, what we talk about here in the office and then use it in their day to day because what they discover, even like, again, talking with Gunner, you know, our big thing is sustainability. Ah. Make it sustainable. It's not a quick fix. Oh, try keto. Try intermittent fasting. Just don't eat. Oh, how about the medical medium? Let's do celery juice. <laughs> so I guess I don't have to ask you your stance on fat diets. Um, Look, I, was yeah. like, I said I was a fat little kid, man. Yeah. No fun. And everybody wants a fat diet. They want a quick fix. They right. want to take a pill. It's kind of like, how's it feel to want, man? It doesn't mm -hmm. work like that. No. Well, and, that, and that, I'm glad to hear you say that too. Um, it, it just so happens. I've, I've had a couple like nutrition oriented conversations recently. Um, and I got to be honest, like as someone who really loves learning about health and fitness, um, and, and one of my biggest things is like mental performance. Like Ooh. I still have a day job. I'm in sales and tech and I have three kids. Like I got to be sharp. You know, I can't, I can't start not showing up in any one of those areas. Uh, and then on top of the podcast, and, and so for me, I'm like, you know, what, what is the best diet approach? What are the right things I can be doing? And it's, it's very confusing. And I think part of what makes it so confusing is there's just so much, you know, just bullshit out there. I think, um, I think the big thing, you know, when you say diets, just like what you're saying, I don't want to interrupt, but I'm just throwing No, it please. I think that, that, that people, most people, I thought, you know, 90% of people have a real adversarial relationship with food. Uh, like they view food as the thing that makes them fat hmm. and when they join a gym and they work out and they train and they work out and they train and they might drop a few pounds in the beginning they might get a little stronger in the beginning and then poof they get injured yeah or well, they don't see the results they want now if you ask any athlete hey tell me about the gym tell me about your workouts what do they do like yeah. gunner will tell you again he'll the, every athlete will tell you the training I do makes me weak. It breaks me down. Training is a mm. catabolic event that inflames us. So training is catabolic. It breaks you down. It makes you weaker. At the end of leg day at Gold's Gym, you're not stronger. You are weaker. Mm. At the yeah. end of an hour of a Peloton training session, you're weaker. You're not stronger. Yeah, your legs are jello. Right. So training sets you up, but your kitchen and bedroom, those are your anabolic environments. So if your nutrition is not as strategic as your training, you'll mm -hmm. end up injured and sad about your results. Right. And Gunnar and I will banter back and forth all the time. I'll say 80% kitchen, 20% gym. He'll say, fuck you, 80% gym, 20% kitchen. <laughs> and then we'll end up like 50-50, which is really what it is. It's a brotherhood between training and nutrition. Yeah. You gotta have both. You gotta have your training, your nutrition, your hydration, and your sleep patterns. It's literally like a little box and you wanna stay centered in that box. Mm. And it sounds weird, but literally fattest guy in the room eats the least. Okay. So maybe, maybe we can dive into that a little bit uh, and, and not to yeah. keep reverting back to this Russell Wilson diet, yeah. but I, I remember the thing that stuck out the first time I read it was, you know, and I'm not to tell your story for you, but yeah. he came to you wanting to like lose weight, get quicker, be less injury prone. Right. And after working with you, his, his calories didn't go down. They actually went up dramatically yeah. and he ate more meals go ahead yeah another example kevin love same thing ah okay right k love i mean amazing again and like russell amazing human but yeah here's somebody who was you know fairly husky for a basketball player at ucla right yeah no, I remember those days. in the nba he wanted to be leaner and he mm -hmm. is a very close friend of gunners and gunners said look go see golia he'll dial you in and literally we took him from x percent of body fat all the way down to like six yeah. And here was a guy that was eating over 6,000 calories a day. To, to get leaner. To get leaner. So here's the story. Here it is. Okay. In a, yeah. in a nutshell. So he just said that weird counterintuitive thing. Fattest guy in the room eats the least, right? Mm -hmm. So 
take huge Tommy. Tommy weighs 400 pounds, right? He's not overeating. He has two pairs of pants to fit. He doesn't look good in them. He looks really bad out of them. He hasn't had a date in like four years. So yeah. Tommy has a donut in the morning and then he has salad, you know, at lunch with the girls because he doesn't want anybody to see him eat. Then he sneaks a couple Snickers bars in the afternoon with some coffee because he's so exhausted and tired. He gets right. home for dinner and maybe he has pasta, maybe he has a loaf of bread, maybe he has nothing. But if Tommy is 400 pounds, and let's say, but nobody really is, 50% body fat, he has yeah. 200 pounds carrying around 200 pounds of stuff that doesn't move. Tell me that's not tiring and exhausting and that the 200 pounds mm. of lean tissue is strong. Right. If somebody gave you a 45-pound plate and said, here, hold this, don't let go of it, bring it back tonight, <laughs> you'd be fried. Yeah. Or yeah. Walking around with a hundred pound flak jacket on like right. your body so, carrying that weight is, yeah. But Tommy, hundred pound Tommy is wicked athletic, hmm. but he just doesn't see it. And he, and he's so upset because he's tried fasting and under eating and, you know, green juicing only and his weight doesn't budge. Hmm. It doesn't budge because Tommy, like so many others are confused about, a distinction about metabolism. Metabolism is not fast or slow like we hear about. In fact, it's actually hot or cold. So that's one of the things I definitely wanted to ask you about. Yeah, we, we, yeah. would you expand on that? Yeah, metabolism, hot or cold. Why is metabolism hot or cold? Why is metabolism a function of heat? Well, calories are heat energy units. Mm -hmm. Metabolism is a function of that heat as it relates to heat energy units. And then fat, our body fat is a lipid, it's an oil. It will only convert to energy in a calorically hot environment, hmm. kind of like butter on a stove. So if you do not eat enough heat in the right nutrient pattern that suits your own individual chemistry, mm -hmm. you're not going to draw fat. Now, you might lose some weight, yeah, but you're going to lose muscle, right? Muscle's heavy and dense. It doesn't take up much room. Like your fist is five pounds of muscle, kind of. And then four or five of your fists is literally five pounds of fat. So you might lose some weight. You won't take up much less room in the room. And one day you've been over to pet your cat and your back goes out. Hmm. So it's eating is heating. Now oh, let's say okay. you're dropping weight, but you notice you're stronger in the gym. Well, if you're stronger in the gym, something has had to have happened to your muscle. So yeah. if you're stronger, you got more muscle. More muscle, more food, more training, more food, more muscle, more food. Yeah. So you eat up and feed into a heat pattern. More muscle you have, more fat you end up using as an energy source. And oh, then just okay. to top it off, let's face it, if under eating worked, people wouldn't be fat. It's easy to skip meals. I can yeah. skip roll it up. It's not dropping my weight. Yeah. If under eating worked, people wouldn't be fat. So it requires work to eat your food. It is difficult. And generally speaking, it's people's weak muscle. So I say work on your weak muscle, work on eating, see food as an advocate, be as strategic with your nutrition as you are with your training. Hmm. They literally are a brotherhood, like, yeah. you know, again, like Gunnar would say. So, so a brotherhood of food programming. And then you say, great, but what, what are the foods? Like, where do I start? Do I right. go plant-based because all the guys that are plant-based are saying meat's in my stomach for four months and it's going to cause cancer. You know, do I go with the keto guys because they say plants, if I eat a lot of sugars, I'm going to end up with diabetes. And then the Mediterranean guys, you know, like kind of a, a paleo or dual structure, right? That, mm. uh, that Barry Sears zone thing. They say eat a little bit of everything because, you know, everything in balance. Yeah. What do I do? So imagine geography for a second. Yeah. Imagine Alaska. There you are, an Eskimo in Alaska. And you're looking around that barren tundra of nothing but ice and snow. Are you eating a lot of vegetables there? Probably not. Probably not. Yeah. But there's a bunch of whale blubber and a lot of salmon. You eating that? Absolutely. Well, yeah, the yeah. occasional polar bear or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> an Arctic fox. An Arctic fox. But the meats are easier to eat. They're yeah. geographically, right? Mm -hmm. Then your vegetables, legumes, all the tomatoes, all that stuff. And those people, no heart attacks, nothing. Cholesterol hmm. over the tank. Geographically speaking, those folks, because of geography and climate, have become very fat and protein efficient. Hmm. A metabolic type, very keto-esque, let's say, right? Fat okay. and protein efficient. Or like Atkins, I'd rather say Atkins. Okay. Then we zip over to a, another, let's go to Africa. Right, where the animals are mean, they mm. won't eat you. 
and they right. run super fast. Yeah. There's lots of tubers floating around. There's lots of vegetables and grains. Are those guys eating a lot of meat? I don't think so. Probably not as much. Probably yeah. Not, because they're a little afraid of yeah. getting attacked. <laughs> and, and if you take a look at their physiques, they're taller, leaner, higher mm-hmm. endurance capacity, right? Back right. in Eskimo world, they're shorter, thicker, stockier, more muscle. Yeah. So in that climate, in that geography, they are more carbohydrate efficient, more plant-based. Huh. Then you zip over to Spain. You go, damn, you're eating some salmon, you're eating some lamb, you're eating some tubers, you're eating some rice, grains, vegetables. Damn, you guys are eating a little bit of everything. Hmm. No heart problems there with that group. No heart problems in Africa with that group. So we are really geographically created. And then you take a look at the United States, and we became the melting pot. Right. So ultimately, three metabolic structures exist. Someone can be fat and protein efficient, carbohydrate efficient, or they have a dual structure. Okay. So it's okay to eat healthy. Healthy is great. Like eat your salmon, fantastic. But wouldn't be wouldn't it be more interesting to know what percentage of each macronutrient best suits you? Mm. So ultimately, you pull a lipid profile, HDLs, LDLs, triglyceride levels, even HbA1c and hematocrit. So let's just say we, we did that. We looked at somebody's lipid profile and they had crappy LDLs. LDLs were through the roof, lousy HDLs, like 18 for a good guy fat. Hmm. But they want to start a high fat keto-esque food program. Like, that's a bad idea. They don't have the genetic capacity to use fat and protein efficiently, right? Hmm. High LDLs, low HDLs. Right, right, right. Their triggers, their triglyceride levels, and indi- a, a marker that indicates sugar management is crazy low, like under 110. They've got a marker that says they can use sugars really well. Well, if it's not meat with eyes, if it's not chicken, fish, steak, turkey, eggs, and nuts and seeds, it's a sugar. Right. right. So if you can run, swim, take a dump in the woods, it's a protein and fat. Otherwise, <laughs> it's sugar you just made it so much easier for me. Oh, to, I, I'll easy. actually remember that now. Well, That's no, forever. You know, run, swim, take a dump in the woods. You get a heartbeat and you can see something. You're a protein and a fat. Everything <laughs> else is sugar. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, I'll, I'll got, never forget that. As as you got, got, right? My, my life is filled with one-liners, like definition of water, it. fish must swim in it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. So with 35 so, years of one-liners. So you can't, why would you go on a high fat, high food program if your lipid profile looked like that? Let's say the reverse is true and you want to go plant-based because your pal, Polly lost 15 pounds plant-based. You say, I'm going for it, man. I'm eating phew, plant-based stuff. But there's mm. diabetes in your family background, and your HbA1c and triglyceride levels are already through the roof. Why would you, why would you go plant based? Need nothing but sugar. That wouldn't suit you. Hmm. So more than one metabolic structure. So is is this where you start with? Um, and you can you can tell me if I'm if I'm reading too much into this. But when you start talking about performance with your athletes. I mean, d- does it even start with taking this step back of thinking about? I imagine it's it, you know it's these lipid tests, um, but are you are you taking into like this geographic history into consideration when you start mapping it out, or is this just like a really good a visual example of like yeah, why it has to be individualistic? Example. Just a yeah. good visual example of like you know no everybody should eat the same way, just eat in moderation. So that's what the Eskimos are doing. That's what you're telling me right now. You know, no eat the same way. No, so that's what you know. Look, it's important to eat healthfully. It's important to remove anything that's inflammatory away from your food program because we all know, we all damn well know that inflammation is the ager in us. It ages us, it adversely affects joint health, Hmm. cognitive focus, digestive health. So I always start with the, look, my clinic is very athletically based, performance driven. So nothing that inflames you, no yeast, no mold, no dairy, no gluten. And they're like, what? Like a possum in the headlights. Like, what? What do you mean? Well, no dairy. Dairy is like eating phlegm. And it adversely affects oxygen utilization. Like, why would an asthmatic consume dairy? So dairy is gassium loading. Wait, hang on. <laughs> my, fa- my favorite. Uh, uh, oh, that was a, uh, a giant emoji turd pen that, uh, uh, that farts on demand. This is going to be a great, this is going to be one of our best episodes, if not the best, without question. (laughs) So yeast mold dairy, yeast mold, does we know dairy, phlegm, no phlegm. 
And then yeast, mold, gluten means no bread breads, muffins, bagels, hoi bread, sandwich breads. If it's mashy and fluffy and sits on a shelf, sliced up in a bag, don't have the damn thing. Hmm. Like one ingredient starches like potatoes, rice, yams, oatmeal, oat flakes, oat puffs, one ingredient starches. And that's that's pretty universally true, yeah. no matter those three profiles no that you described. Because even like me, I'm fat and protein efficient. Honestly, I swear to God, if I eat more than like a baseball size of rice a day, I want to shoot postal workers and take naps. I'm out of my mind. <laughs> I don't do well with sugar. I swear. God is my witness. If there was cookie dough on your shoulder, I'd jump through my computer and <laughs> your shoulder to get to the cookie dough. <laughs> you know. So, so, so can, can we talk a little bit about uh, yeah, the inflammation piece of that? Because I, that's something that I've heard. Um, and I'm like, okay, yeah, it totally makes sense. Inflammation's bad. But can we talk about like what's actually happening in the body and, and why uh, it is so destructive? It's, uh, it's a response to, to nutrients and enzymes that adversely affect immune system, autoimmune, cellular mm -hmm. repair. Okay. Like yeast and mold, mold, you know, there are certain molds, certain yeast groupings that inflame us. That's just what they do. Yeah. Gluten is an inflammatory protein. Now, you don't have to have celiac sprue, a true gluten intolerance. intolerance or, yeah, intolerance to stay away from gluten and still have, like me, I've got two fake shoulders, I got two fake knees, I got a fake hip, I have a fake femur from all the stupid shit I've done. So I, I inflame easy and I'm fat and protein efficient. So I, I inflame easy above and beyond that just through, through carbohydrate. I shouldn't consume like too much of it. Yeah. So, you know, we were, we're a product of our nutritional environment, our nutritional choicing as yeah. well. If you under eat, you'll inflame too. Now there are, oh, good, interesting. yeah, there are good reasons to under eat. But only if there's a gastrointestinal issue or, or if you really have a medical issue that's putting you in a static state where you're not active. Hmm. But I think the most important thing to remember with activity is that if you're active, you're breaking down muscle tissue. If you're breaking down muscle tissue, you need to repair it. Even in that intermittent fasting world, you take a guy, take an NBA guy, Kevin Love, somebody, anybody, and go, hey, man, just finished a game. You played most of the game I saw. Yeah, I played most of the game. I'm so tired. But you, I'm doing this intermittent fasting thing, and it is 11 o'clock at night. Well, probably shouldn't eat, right? Dude, you just played the entire game. I know, but it's 11. <laughs> I'm like, bro. <laughs> Be careful. I'm also like, come on. Well, here's a question for you. And, uh, you know, my wife, uh, we've talked about it on the show a couple of times. She, she's done this fast mimicking diet. Sure. Uh, yeah. And the, her intent is longevity based. So to, to what extent do, you know, nutrition recommendations start to deviate when we start talking about like performance versus what might be ideal for someone who is focused on like longevity and rejuvenation, or am I incorrect in assuming that they even have to deviate? I, I, I think that, so there's a lot of research out there about ultra low calorie food programming and longevity. And it, the science makes sense to me on some levels, but then you mm. take that science and you, you insert it into Idaho or Montana. Mm. Now, are you going to get anybody there to ultra, ultra low calorie diet? Like who's going to do that there? Yeah. Now they do it incorrectly and their lifestyle is such that they're active on their farm or they've got a bunch of kids or mm. they're really working like crazy hours. And yeah. their blood sugar levels drop because of their, of their ultra low calorie feeding. And then wild horses can't drag them away from lemon meringue pie. <laughs> so how good ultimately was the ultra low calorie food programming and how sustainable was it for that person and their lifestyle? Now, if you're, if you're in Nepal and you're a monk and you're meditating all day long, and you right. have that type of lifestyle that has a very low heart rate activity and you don't have any stress from your four-year-old kid or your 16-year-old daughter. Yeah. I want to go out with Tommy, damn it. I like him. <laughs> Dude, Tommy's a felon. What are you thinking? <laughs> you know, real life stuff. Yeah. You have a food program that does not stimulate a craving and supports cognitive focus proper digestion so you're having a bowel movement or two a day 
proper hydration so you feel good about your skin and your and your your and gastric release you know your digestion mm -hmm. you want to feel strong and supported like your spine doesn't support posture all your muscles around it do yeah well it doesn't require not eating that requires eating mm. and then you think about technology man we're huh Dude, I'm in the bathroom at night answering emails for crying out loud. I mean, it never right. stops anymore, which is great. Don't get me wrong. I absolutely love that. But if I'm going to do that, I'm going to fuel myself to do that. Yeah. To get a deep REM sleep, to be strategic with my foods throughout my day. Can, can you talk a little bit about that, the uh, the being strategic throughout the day? And again, not to keep referring to this Russell Wilson diet, but that was one of the things that I was like, oh, wow, that's that's so interesting how everything is. Uh, so, yeah, purposeful is the exact word. Yeah, yeah, purposeful. Look, the reason why you do this podcast is because there's an aspect of it that you love about creating a legacy, like good mm. information for people. Like, Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. You want to help people. You, you want to help them, to be of service to them. Yeah. Well, in order to be of service to them, you have to be of service to yourself, too, so that you're the best you can be in this conversation, collaboratively speaking back and forth, cognitively focused about it. Mm. And that, you know, that really does boil down to food programming, ultimately. Like, man, think of a little kid. I can feel a little kid sugars all day long. And he's freaking out. Right. <laughs> he's losing his mind. I can feel yeah. him his proteins and fats and all of a sudden he's settled he's the best little kid in the world we're no different we're the same way as adults you feed me sugars all day long i'm gonna chop your head off and shoot a postal worker or something be out of yeah. my mind <laughs> but you give me the foods i need and all of a sudden you know 80 percent of the time anyways i'm a nice guy man. yeah, yeah right, right right so as long as the mail gets there on time <laughs> everyone's so, safe so you know foods shouldn't be adversarial and then ultimately in that food programming idea look take one free meal a week meal, not day. Take a free meal, eat whatever the hell you want. Get it out of your system. Fine. Go for it. Knock yourself out. Park yourself in front of Krispy Kreme for all I care. But be true to your foods otherwise when you get back on track with your meal pattern. Because, because ultimately, because this thing is so heat driven, it's very consequential. Like when I hand you a food plan, I say, here, follow these foods. It will take your body 48 hours, two days to create heat. Like a stove burner kind of heating up. For, for, 48 hours yeah. from, from, from when you started. Oh, okay. You start in the morning with your foods. Now it's going to take you two days to create a heat structure where your body starts to get used to this thing oh, and understands how to manage new heat. And the new heat's being generated by eating yeah, right. the right macronutrients in yeah. the right kind of, uh, what's order. the word I'm looking for? Order. Meal order. Meal, meal order. order. Oh. Sort of meal timing. Meal order. So you do that, right? You get through the first two days, you you got your Tupperware, you're all lined up, day one, day two, day three, all of a sudden in day four, you skip a meal, a donut sneaks in, you didn't have starch at lunch, you put it at dinner. Did you not mismanage your calories in that day? Mm. Yes, right? So if you mismanage calories, you mismanage heat, at which point metabolism will cool. You're not as efficient, so you lose that day that you're in for the efficient use of fat. Now it's going to take you two more days to reclaim the pattern. You oh, just wow. blew three days. If you do that twice a week, you lost your week. So I hmm. tell people, and it's sort of appropriate, sort of inappropriate. I'll tell people, look, man, if it's 11 o'clock at night, you have not eaten meals four or five and six, you need to get a fork. Start eating, you'll have a shitty sleep, your digestion will suck, but I teach you a little less, and then you get your food in, and you won't let it happen again. Huh. Eat your meals in order. Timing isn't important unless you're getting paid by Marvel action adventure films to be a superhero. Right. Eat your meals. Five minutes can separate one meal from the next. And if you get to a meal and you've watched this podcast or you read my book or something and you say, goalie is nuts. I can't eat this crap. I'm stuffed. Hmm. Don't worry. You don't have to finish the meal, but you can't skip it. Oh, okay. A couple of blueberries you got for a snack. Have a blueberry. Move on. Hmm. Let it go. Don't force the food down, but you've got to establish a structure and a template to manage the nutrients. If you never give it that open door, it'll never know. Hmm. But you got to start somewhere. So, well, I, I have two questions. Uh, and actually, maybe because this is probably what people are wondering. Uh, you know, wh where where does the average person find this template, right? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people like, well, I got to look up performance, you know, <laughs> fitness, and I got to try and see if there's a slot. No, they're saying, this guy's full of shit. This stuff doesn't No, come on, man. <laughs> you know, but, but 
but for the person who's like, man, I love this. I love the thought of it. Uh, my brain's wired this way. I want to dive in. Like where, how do they start putting together this sort of structure for themselves? Or is it the sort of thing where, you know, it is a bit of a fine tuned process and you do need like guidance. Look, I think anything you do that's better than what you're doing now is yeah. epic, right? So really what I'm asking people to do when they, they take a part of me or they read my book or they come to the office or they use even the G plans website, which is kind of an online program of what we do here. All I'm asking for them to do is to create some value in their day. Like is creating value a donut or is creating value having 12 almonds and a piece of fruit, mm. right? You know, create value. Like, Oh, I'm so happy when I get home, I have two glasses of wine. Well, let's make happy something different. Why don't we go for a walk for 35 minutes or 40 minutes, yeah. right? Why don't yeah. you really work on food preparation and make some nice salmon and veggies? Like, like redefine, create a paradigm of what happy and gratification really means to you. Because mm. ultimately, and you know, man, sometimes I wish I was like 30 again, but Christ, at 61, I can tell you, I am begging for a youthful future. Like that's mm. what I want to create. And that's what I want to coach people into coach them into a youthful future and mm. coach them into an idea. Here's an idea. Cause this, it always pops up with everybody, but, but, but so many times women, because they, they are so, they are so judged, right? Everybody's like, uh, yeah, oh, man, well, uh, you know, they already got something to say, right? Uh, absolutely. Way as so, much as social media is not helping anybody. Yeah, right? Social media is not helping. <laughs> but here, way as much as you can take up less room in the room. Mm. And everybody, male or female, will look at me like a possum in headlights, and they're like, what? Well, muscles heavy and dense, fat's light and fluffy, it takes up a lot of room. So take up less room in the room, weigh as much mm. as you can, muscles heavy. No one gives a shit about what you weigh. They care about your waist, about your dress size, about your posture, right. about endurance capacity. No one gives a shit about your weight. And mm. in sports, like with Russell or any of the athletic guys that I work with, Remember, there are two types of weights. You can have functional tissue, which controls momentum. You can have non-functional tissue that your functional tissue has to control. Hmm. Because the non-functional tissue adversely affects controlled momentum. So if hmm. I remove non-functional tissue off me and add more functional tissue, then as a tennis player, tennis player, as a baseball player, don't you maintain a better groove, a better stroke, a quarterback, a more consistent throwing pattern? Because yeah. that muscle tissue is no longer controlling so much tissue that might be non-functional. Hmm. And it throws momentum out the door if you get fatigued. Yeah. So have as no. much controllable momentum on you as you possibly can. Get rid of the non-controllable momentum, fat, but you can't do that through starving because that's a catabolic event, unless you're a monk in Nepal. Right. And ultimately, it's got to be sustainable, which kind of leads us into that, the water thing. Yeah, I would love to dive into I, this. Know, water is so underrated, it's weird. So there are a couple of rules for hydration. First uh, first off, you know, water is fish must swim in it. It's my one line. Yeah, I mean, that's a, and, that's a given. But I'm people just saying, are, people are nodding. Food. They're like, yeah. They'll drink <laughs> sparkling water, and all of a sudden, they're holding more water than the Hoover Dam on their body. They can't figure out why. It's that deep mineral con, not sodium, but just deep minerals in a sparkling uh -huh. water that will cause you to hold. So fish must be in your water. The rule of thumb, if you're inactive, is half your weight in ounces of water. So oh, okay. pounds, you need 100 ounces. The best way to drink your water is in liters. Like that's 33 ounces. So 333 30, is a honey, right? Mm, yeah. The maximum amount of water for performance purposes is 100, is, is, is one ounce per pound of body weight. So if you weigh 200 pounds, 200 ounces. 200 ounces. So, okay. so it's six of these. But why is yeah. water important? So other than moving nutrients and toxins through your system, water regulates your temperature. You drink that mm. stuff, you perspire and sweat. Like you and I right now are perspiring and sweating. We don't even see it. That mm. perspiration and sweat controls our temperature as we relate to different environments in our day. If your water is low, and you cannot regulate temperature. Our bodies are smart and protective. So they will mm. sense that as trauma. And they say, don't worry, I got to make sure you survive. So our bodies adapt. 
So instead of using perspiration to control temperature, your body will hoard fat underneath your skin to act as insulation to control your temperature. Oh, wow. So if your foods are perfect and your water is low, you're hoarding fat. So if your water is low, you're hoarding fat. Like water runs the show. Huh. The more you drink, the more you thirst, without a doubt. You just, in the beginning, you will become intimate with every restroom. You'll pee like crazy. Yeah. Is, is, I, I've you also heard there's a- You may meet new friends. <laughs> Silver lining. Uh, so I, I have heard that before. Is, is there any risk of people drinking too much water? Because I, I, I have seen the person who walks around yeah. with the, Yeah, please go ahead. Hypernutremia. Look, you get those water challenges and all of a sudden you're hypernutremic and you're passing out and you, you've depleted all your electrolytes because you're peeing like crazy and you're not heavily salting your foods. Yeah, there's that type of hypernutremia. Yeah. There's also the hypernutremia from endurance athletes that are using water only to hydrate themselves during an endurance sport, be it a, a marathon or ultra marathon or, or Ironman. And mm-hmm. at that point, because our heart is built around electricity and electrolytes and the firing of that, if mm-hmm. you adversely affect that to a point, your heart can't beat, hmm. your heart stops. Hence, hence, a, hence hypernutremia. That's hence a problem. Hence a problem. Damn, I almost got across the finish line until my heart stopped beating. So, so like an endurance world for athletes, you always drink water first to establish a sweat rate. Now you've started to deplete electrolytes and you start shoving electrolyte patterns back into you after that point. But you never start with electrolytes first because you can't shove electrolytes into a cell that hasn't depleted any yet. Hmm. And that will adversely affect sweat rate. So let me ask you this, like, all right, I, I'm a, I'm a pretty active guy. I wake up in the morning, early morning workout, generally weightlifting of some sort or and do you train fasted. Uh, so, okay. So I often, I would just out of necessity, like, cause I, so I live in Bucks County. I think I said that on this yeah. episode, uh, but I would commute to New York, which is just stupid. Two, two hours each way. It was a nightmare. No, there's a train in the middle. There's a subway at the end. There's a car at the beginning. It, yeah. A lot of podcasts actually, oh you know? Um, so like, you know, I'm up, at, I would be up at like five, five thirty, and yeah. I would just get up, work out so that I could get it all done. And so I would train fasted, but this is one of the things I talked to Gunner about and oh man, full circle. I remember reading, uh, that article a few years ago and I was like, Oh, I need, to, I need to get like some peanut butter in. I need to get some molasses in before. So I was doing that. I was doing that back then, but then I went through a long stretch training fasted. Um, but now after talking to Gunner and him setting me straight on a number of topics, yes. <laughs> Split nutrition. There's your sugar and fat. Love yeah. I'm going gonna, gonna to order some. So, so okay. Love love oh, thank you. So, okay. So fasted training. I would love to talk to you about this really quickly. And I know we're coming up at the end cause you've got a busy schedule. Mm. Um, fat fasted nutrition or sorry, fasted training. Is that, that's a, that's a no go. Well, years ago we did that as bodybuilders, right? And we, the thought was we will use fat as an energy source yeah. but between weights and cardio. And speaking of that, you always lift first cardio second. You, you always lift when you're the strongest, most stable as you're lifting, you're depleting blood sugar, increasing heart rate. So when you climb on your cardiovascular modality, you utilize fat at a faster rate, mm. Not cardio first and then weights because then you're okay. weaker anyways. And no, that's can, that that alone actually I think is really yeah. insightful for people. Yeah. There's a lot of people who think they're doing the right thing, yeah, getting their body good. warm, jogging good for good. 20 minutes. Good good for. So so you train fast and then at some point your body says, damn, I guy's not giving me anything. I better I better become more efficient at the use of a calorie and hoard some fat. Because I don't know what he's mm. doing. So folks that are training early in the morning and have that fasted idea, they're pretty fit already. You know, they're in the fitness culture. So yeah. so their bodies are not grossly obese where they have tons of fat to use. Mm-hmm. So their bodies are super smart and very sensitive. And this is what we discovered that, that at that point when you're training fasted, you actually inhibit the full use of fat as an energy source. But if you give it a little bit of sugar and fat, not a ton, but literally back in the day, it was a tablespoon of jam, tablespoon of almond butter, you know, you were a split packet like this, which is your fruit yeah. and almonds, right? So yep. you take that and your body says, oh, a little sugar, a little fat, let's go. So you train with a higher intensity level with a higher caloric burn. Yeah. And you utilize fats more efficiently. Well, let me ask you this question. Um, and 
Is it possible? Because I, I get conflicting information, and I think this is why people are just so frustrated in general. They're like, I don't know if I can eat eggs or not. Like, will someone just tell me if I can have an egg? Can you uh, put on, you know, muscle mass while also Getting losing it. weight? Or maybe, maybe the better question is burning fat, because there seems to be a couple schools of thought. I think so. Look, if you're getting stronger in the gym, you're adding muscle. You can't get stronger without adding muscular density, right? Mm -hmm. As you develop more muscle on your frame, assuming you're eating correctly to do it, then more muscle you have, more fat you use as an energy source, right? Mm -hmm. so fat begets a muscle, more muscle begets the use of fat as energy. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think you get leaner and add muscle without a doubt. We did it as bodybuilders, though we were supplemented with a lot of drugs. Help it out, but in, you know, in the purest sense of it, yeah, sure, why not? You know, you can definitely okay. drop body fat and improve muscular density. Yeah, you know, I got a lot of guys in here that ultimately end up just weighing the same. They come in, mm. they come in here. I'm 185. I'm fat as shit, and I want to get down to like 160. No, you don't. No, based on the numbers, you actually, you actually need about 16 more pounds of muscle to truly support your posture based on your height. So when mm. you add the 16 pounds of muscular density, you drop your body fat, and you're at 12%. Guess what? Your weight stays the same. Yeah, but you're taking up uh, less weight in the room. Yeah, as they say. Less, less room in the room. Less room in the room. Oh, God damn it. Less room in the room. Worry about your waist, not your weight. I don't know. So I was just saying, you know, you can get as scientific as you want about this stuff, but you still gotta, you have to you have to relate it to what really is real life available to you. Like, how do you make yeah. it sustainable? There's a, there's a guy I love reading and Gunnar loves reading, a guy named Biolane, who is literally an encyclopedia of everything nutritional and sports mm. driven. It's like reading some of his posts are, are incredible. It's like textbook. And I'm like, this guy is the smartest guy in the world. He's like, so this is ridiculous. And I love reading this stuff because – I can pull from it, you know, and use it in real life. But yeah, you can't just like the other guys that will pull science only and say, no, this is how it is. Like, like ultra low calorie food programming, right? Or right. fasting. Mm -hmm. You got to look at our world these days and times with our cultures and how we manage our family, our career, our own emotions and our own fractures. Me, like even in the big leg picture, I still felt like I was a fat little kid. Hmm. You know, we, we have these emotional fractures that we do need to take care of as it relates to our physique and our, our physique, our performance, close on, close off, man, that's the most intimate thing we got. Yeah. You got to be respectful for it. You got to give yourself, I hate the word, but I'll use it, decent self-care. But hmm. that comes from creating value. That comes from being unreasonable. Like if you, if I take care of myself, I can take care of you better. I promise. You know, if I support myself and, and I, I never hear a no in the room. I hear yeses. I can take care of you better. I mm -hmm. can embrace difficult stuff and I can say difficult's good. So it's not really stress I'm experiencing. It's just stress is a scale of one to 10 about how difficult the thing is. And if you're not yeah. pushing towards a difficult thing, then you, you know, maybe you're mediocre or scared. But many times the more functional things we do, like food programming, which is why people come in here. They're not good at it. And they failed four or five times because a buddy told them to come and see me because, you know, we've never advertised, never done any of that crap. So it's all mm -hmm. referral based. So they come in knowing this is their weak muscle and they feel ashamed about it. It's not, you shouldn't feel shame. You should feel an opportunity to shift and fail a little bit to succeed better later. But mm -hmm. that requires just collaboration, coaching, and a decent amount of sarcasm. Uh, you know, so you should don't make your chocolate pie mean anything. Right, right, right. Chocolate pie. <laughs> so what? You know, but like, and it goes back to everything has a consequence type thing. You know, mm -hmm. kind of like if your physique were working, what would it look like? Oh, it would look like this. All right, so who do you need to be to make that happen? Who's the who? Did, well, who's the guy you need to be to have that kind of physique? What's he doing? He ain't eating chocolate pie. I can promise you that. Right. You know, as you say, the same thing with relate. If my relationship were working, what would it look like? You know, right. If, if my life were working, what would it look, who do you need to be to make that happen? And, you know, quite frankly, if you're not happy with your waistline, you got to ask yourself, who are you being to have a waistline you don't want? Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. Oh, I love that, man. I also, uh, I, I love the fact that you have to keep sustainability at the forefront of the decision you're making. Right. Sure. And it's like, does a textbook say yes? 
fine. The textbook doesn't have three kids, has to talk to people on sales calls all day. And you know what I mean? It doesn't deal with the stress of trying to. So like, uh, you don't have your kids pretzels in the, in the, in the pantry either. Right. You know, they're so easy to grab and smell good. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh man. Well, Hey, doc, Dr. G, this was, this is absolutely awesome. I really appreciate you taking the time. This was a fantastic well, conversation. Cool. I feel like I have so much more to like vomit out. Oh yeah. Well, Hey, I'm not, I'm not going to stop you, but we can, we can also always have you back on. I I don't want to, whenever you're ready, pull me back in. Let's do some more. And even if, uh, you know, you bring me and Gunnar in together on at the same time or, you know, Oh, that'd be fun. Like bio lane, that guy is super smart, ridiculous. You know, there is a lot of good information out there. Ultimately it boils down to how do you insert it into your lifestyle so you can make it work for you. So you don't feel bad about it. Right. You're not in a bad mood about it. Yeah. And how do you make it sustainable in the, in the long term, in the long run? How, and and if you are a dad, if you are a mom, how are you the mirror for your kids? Like when they ask you, why do you drink so much water? Tell them why. Yeah. You know? Let them see it. You know, children, they learn empirically like so many of us still do. We learn and we mm-hmm. watch, you know. Um, so, it's funny you say that. That's that's one of the things. And look, I'm not going to say I let, I let them do it every time. But now my kids get up earlier and earlier. Right. So that, that morning time that used to be mine is it's no longer my time. But one of the things um, and I'm glad to hear you kind of reinforce this is I think there's a lot of value in having them watch you work out. And it doesn't have to be working out or, get, you know, one of the things I loved, I, I brought up that decathlon that I would do and it would be once a year and I would train like an animal for it. But I love the fact that, you know, even you know, now I'm 34, they would get a chance to see me in like a competition right. type well, environment. Fun. And I just, to your point, I was like, man, I just, I think that's so valuable for them to kind of get to get that exposure because like you said, it's, it's empirical learning. Yep. And you know, they, they learn that there's winning, losing, what does it take to be on the podium? Mm -hmm. And for the guys that weren't on the podium, you know, what kind of attitudes do they have? Are people whining or are they going, I want to be that guy? Mm -hmm. You know, what do I need to do to be that guy on the podium? Cause I'm not going to let this happen again. Yeah. 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 Oh, absolutely, man. This has been awesome. We're, def- we're definitely going to have you back. If, uh, uh, if, if, bring if you back. Allow bring me back. Bring me back and we do like all kinds of cool stuff, whatever you want. This is so That much sounds fun. good, man. That sounds good.